We get to look now at Peter's cross. Peter's cross. The Apostle Peter is the, the, the subject there. And, and really, I, I think we need to start with some negative clarifications. That we're not thinking this evening about, Jesus, about, about Peter being crucified, as we're, we're, we read later, seems to have been the way that he was martyred. He's crucified by his own request, upside down of all things. And there's a possible reference to that in Scripture at the end of John. That's not Peter's cross for the evening. We're, we're, we're thinking about the gospel according to Peter, though. But I don't mean the document that is called the gospel of Peter that's not in our Bibles for good reason. That's a whole other discussion that's not the sermon tonight. So just saying that's not what I'm thinking about. And I'm not thinking about the gospel according to Mark, although often it's thought Peter was, was a consultant for that. Now, of course, the Holy Spirit being, regardless of any of that, the author behind Mark's words. I'm thinking this evening about Peter's first letter that is in our copy of God's Word in the Scriptures this evening. And so if you haven't seen that, maybe from the handout, you might make your way over in your, your text or tap on your device to 1 Peter We'll begin together in just a moment in 1 Peter. Peter's cross or the gospel according to Peter. The word gospel or phrase good news is found a total of four times in this, these five chapters we call 1 Peter. It's in the first chapter twice and in the fourth chapter twice. You might notice that at the top there. You find it in chapter 1 verses 10 through 12 as the paragraph at least where it's found. When Peter describes the sufferings of the Messiah or of Christ and the subsequent glories that were to follow, that's his two-part summary of the gospel message, the sufferings and glories of the Messiah. And the, you, as you think about the gospel, there are several components that are, just, that are set forth in the Scriptures, but a, at the heart of them is the death and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus is proclaimed in the gospel as a crucified Messiah or Christ. Christ in him crucified is the message in one way of summary. That's in 1 Peter chapter 1. You keep reading 1 Peter 1, you get to verses 22 through 25 as he sets forth the way the word of God is meant to be planted in hearts and then grow. And he says this word of God that penetrates your hearts and also has this permanency to it, it's eternal, he says in verse 25, this is the good news, a.k.a. gospel, that was preached to you. You might put it this way then, that also the Word of God, even now written in Scripture, the heart of it, on the, to reverse the way we look at it, is the gospel message about Jesus. Then finally, in chapter 4, the gospel is said to have been preached in chapter 4, verse 6. And in chapter 4, verse 17, the gospel is said to be something that one can obey. Those are the four times the word is used in 1 Peter. Now let's do something different. As we examine together the cross, specifically that part of the gospel in or from 1 Peter. I have three words for us. Once again, a little pithy, but hopefully, if I can get my throat to cooperate, hopefully they will help us to remember. And I'll give you the three words, so if my voice fails, we've got at least four or five people that, that do preach from time to time, some on a regular basis, here this evening. So somebody else might have to take my three words and make, the, make, make it up from there. Or maybe not make it up. But you know what I mean. I'm really trying not to get myself in trouble after this morning. Somebody told me I needed to go forward tonight, and I needed to respond to my own sermon, so we'll see, what, we'll see about that later. If you don't know what I'm talking about, well, I can fill you in, I guess, when I respond. But here's the three words. That the cross of Jesus in 1 Peter is redemptive, redemptive, it's going to be your R word that starts this evening, and then that the cross is not only redemptive, it is transformative, changes something. And then last, the cross is demonstrated. It's demonstrated of something for us as disciples. Those three, and then the sermon will be ours for the evening.
We began then in 1 Peter chapter 1. We were in chapter 1 and in, in overview in verses 10 through 12. Let's look a little closer at the first couple of verses as we have them in our Bibles. In 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 and 2, with Jesus' cross as redemptive. It's in a, an antique store, but it's being used by the antique store owner as just an old coat rack. There's coats and maybe even a blanket or two laid across it. Someone, as they walk through with a good eye, notices there's something about that piece of wood, that stand. So they take the coats and materials off and unveil an old, worn out, and yet very beautiful, very ornate lamp post. So they purchase this at really no, no price at all. They take it and spend hours restoring the finish. And by the time they're done, it is no longer just an old coat rack. It takes a place in the entranceway of their home, almost with with, with kind of a prominent position. You can't miss it as you walk in. And it now shines as a lamp again in its wonder, in its crafty beauty. That's what Jesus did for us as Christians. Because of the way that Satan and our, our slavery to sin had, in that sense, used us and abused us and misused us for all sorts of different specific purposes, but at the end of the day, for the purpose of, of sin and ultimately death and destruction. But that wasn't our intended purpose. Sin has marred us. Jesus redeems us from that. Like the man that buys the the old coat rack, and restores, redeems, and brings it back to its original purpose. Let's read the text in 1 Peter chapter 1. He begins by by mentioning some that he's addressing. Those in ancient areas, ancient regions of the Roman Empire, like Bithynia and Cappadocia and Galatia. And he said that he's writing to these groups according to, verse 2 says, the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit. He's almost starting to sound like some of Paul's letters when he strings together all these different phrases. He says it's for that and for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with His blood. And then his, he's bestowing, He bestows grace and peace. May it be multiplied to you. Jesus, His cross is redemptive because... When I, when I respond to the gospel, I am in that sense sprinkled with his blood. I'm someone now that I can even say that I'm someone who's sprinkled with the blood of Jesus. And this isn't about trying to, and perhaps some have tried to use this to teach the idea of being sprinkled with water as a form of, of baptism. But the, the statement here goes back to one of two things in the background of God and his people. It goes back to the Day of Atonement under the old law when they would sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies, the most holy place. It goes back to that sacrificial cleansing of sin and guilt. At least that was the picture. It also goes back, possibly the other option here, or maybe it's and or, It goes back to when the covenant is originally agreed upon with Moses and God and the people of God and he takes blood and he sprinkles the law and he sprinkles it. Wouldn't you have loved that, right? Wouldn't you love it if God had his prophets or his preachers, let's say today, sprinkle the recipients of the word with blood? Well, we don't really do that today. You can be thankful for that. But he sprinkled the people with blood. And it was also a sign of this blood-sealed covenant between God and his people. It included the law of God that they were to keep and then, of course, the people themselves. Hebrew writer, if you want to compare a passage that goes into this in some depth in the New Testament Scriptures, the Hebrew writer addresses this in Hebrews chapter 9. He talks about the time when Moses sprinkled the people and what he calls the book with blood. If I'm someone who's sprinkled with the blood of Jesus... That means I have access to what all of those things were pointing to. To the sacrificial work of the Messiah Himself. Of His precious blood. And we're, we're kind of overlapping with this second part, right? 
His blood that was shed and has the power of God and immortal life and cleansing, cleanse us from every stain, all of the marring and guilt of sin. And so we look now at verses 19 or so, 18, and 18 through 21, I believe is the reference there of 1 Peter 1. We are sprinkled by, by the redemptive work of the cross. We are bought by it. That is that, that is that the meaning of redemption or ransom. Let's read it together. Well, actually, we'll begin in verse 17, so we catch the beginning of the sentence. It says, And if you call on him as Father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. Already there's some language drawing on the ancient people of God and their Wilderness wandering and then their even eventual exile in captivity. Knowing, verse, eight, verse 19 now says, that you were ransomed from the feudal ways, or verse 18 still, inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold. Insert there a note that Gant's analogy fails at that point. We're not purchased at an antique store with money or anything like that. But, he says, with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. There's more language drawing on those animal sacrifices, drawing on here even the Passover lamb when they first left Egyptian slavery, when the people of God were said to be ransomed or redeemed. The Hebrew equivalents of the word redeemed are used of that event. They were redeemed from Egyptian slavery. For in Jesus, in his, because of His cross, this evening, you and I are redeemed or bought back from sin such this price, the precious blood of the, capital L, Lamb of God. Isn't that what John, his cousin, said when he saw Jesus in John 1, 29? Behold. The, the Lamb of God that does what? It takes away the sins of the world. So mark it down tonight, and that's going to be that, that, that declaration phrase there. Jesus frees, that's your word, frees us from sin because of His redemptive work. Now notice here, He says, He frees you not just from sin, but from these empty ways, this life that you have these different purposes, but they're really not purposes. He frees you from that. It's almost like generational curses here. It's not, but it's the, it seems to be the idea even of these different ways. Idolatry and sin tends to be passed down through the generation. We tend to follow that what we're given, the example we're given, even in our parents and other ancestors and those in our culture. Part of what is broken is that chain when I become a Christian. And you notice that word in the ESV, it says ways. It's actually the same term that's used, and it's translated as conduct, back in verses 14 through 17. When he says, don't be conformed to your former ignorance. Don't go back to what you were before you were redeemed, but instead be holy in your conduct. Live this time of your exile with a certain reverence or fear in your conduct. Why? Because you have been bought with this significant price of Jesus' blood. You've been redeemed. If you go back to your old way as a Christian of life, it would, it would be like the lampstand that once again becomes just an old hat, coat rack, or hat rack, I guess would work too. And as much as that would be, I mean, it would be, we might look at that and think, oh, oh, how much that pales in comparison to the Christian redeemed by the blood of Jesus who will decide to go back to the the dirt and the misuse of Satan and sin. Jesus' cross in 1 Peter is first redemptive. But then secondly, it is also transformative. Let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 2 now. We're going to look at the last two verses, 24 and 25. Have you ever gone through something, and it might be that what, it's because of what you see, because of what happens to you, something you see, something you ha happens, and you're never the same again. Been there? And you might even say something like, 
I, I'm different now. You might see someone you haven't seen in years, and, and this event or this experience happened in the interim, and you tell them, I'm a different person. I've changed. I'm not the person I was. Well, that is true, and that, that's not always a positive thing, but this is true in every positive sense with Jesus' cross. He transforms us. Let's read about our shepherd in verse 24, 1 Peter chapter 2. It says that he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. You were straying like sheep, but now, he says, you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your soul. You notice how quickly he goes from even the idea of being our sins being taken away to the way we live? That the cross isn't just about saving us from our sins. It is not giving us some mere get-out-of-hell-free card. It is meant to also change or transform, go back to our, our key word, the way we even live. That as we're buried with Jesus, and here you could borrow from 1 Peter 3, 21, where he, des he describes baptism and its saving connection. We could bring in other texts in Paul's letter to, to the Romans, Romans 6, where he says we die to sin as we're buried and then raised. But when I do that, when I die to sin, it's because of Jesus' death. I'm copying his death when I die to sin. And then, I, in a sense, I'm raised to this life for righteousness. Now I have a different master, and he's not just a master, he's my guardian. He's a shepherd that leads. We, borrowing still, there's a lot here from Isaiah 53, borrowing still from that, he says, we were the sheep that went astray, as Isaiah would say. Because of his wounds that's healed heal us, because of his now leadership, we're different. The cross is meant to change who we are. It's not simply about giving us a different status where we go from unsaved to saved. It's meant to make a difference in how we live. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. The just, and that's your word there, I believe, just for unjust. 1 Peter 3, verse 18, adds to this thought of what Jesus' blood and his cross did and still does, really. He says this, For Christ also suffered once for sin. So there's your sin connection. His death was for sin. It was once for all, which the Hebrew writer will really also emphasize. He'll use that phrase, once for all. He died once or suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, or some have, the just for the unjust. And then another of those purpose statements. We already have for sin, and he's, it's, it's for the unjust, their sins, not his, and then that, it goes on to say, he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. And then the rest of that is also for another occasion. But verse 18 tells me that the cross is not just about removing sin, it's not just about making a declaration about things and saying things, and it is. The cross made some declarations. It's also about bringing me, bringing us, as he says, back to God. It is about the fellowship and that connection and closeness and intimacy with God that, yes, sin defeats and eliminates and hinders. It's about a having that restored again. So because of that, Jesus and his cross forever changes us. But we sometimes view it that way. As the death of Jesus, the cross of Jesus, it keeps me from going to hell, and I guess the alternative then is then I, I get to spend eternity in heaven. The cross is meant to, to teach us. It's meant to motivate us. That's part of why we ended this morning with living in the shadow, as if there's a literal shadow of a cross. And you've probably seen portraits and people, artists portrayal that idea of a Christian walking through life, and there's this cross-shaped shadow because nothing in this universe will change our hearts and motivate us to live for righteousness, 1 Peter 2, to be brought back to God than the cross of Jesus.
That's why sometimes we say there, there's no, no worse topic to talk about. Because the cross forces us to confront our sin. It forces us to think about God in flesh, suffering, that kind of excruciating. That's where we get that word excruciating, isn't it, in Latin? From the cross, it's a unique form of suffering and death. But it's also the best thing to talk about for some of the same reasons. Because it's my Savior who went to that bloody cross. Not just so that I, my sins would be forgiven, as much as I'm thankful for that, but that my whole life would be different or transformed. But as the old saying goes, the looks like a duck, walks like a duck. And you could, bring, you could easily bring this back to chapter 1 there in the previous conduct. If we look and act and talk and dress, you name it, like the rest of the world, then we might ask ourselves, how much has the cross of Jesus transformed, truly transformed, my life? Here's our third one for the evening. The cross is redemptive, the cross is transformative, and now thirdly, the cross is demonstrated. I think about the martial arts instructor, and they're always talking about demonstration. You notice that? You watch them on a video or you go to a performance, and it's, well, I'm going to demonstrate this technique now, and then they got to pick on which student is going to be demonstrated on. And sometimes it's not always very comfortable on the receiving end. But you think about the way we learn to do things. And sometimes we'll say something like, can you just show me how to do it? Then I'll know. Then I can do it. When it's some new task or job we're given, can you do it one time and let me watch you? We, we learn from patterns and models. The cross, even as Jesus goes to the cross, as he endures the, what led up to the cross, he demonstrates the way to suffer innocently. Innocent suffering, isn't that the context even we were in? First Peter chapter 2, we were in 24 and 25, that context is suffering and his example. We could go to 1 Peter 3.18 again. That is following statements about suffering when you're doing what's right and being treated like you're doing what's wrong. The reason 1 Peter 3.18 begins with for Christ suffered once for sins. That four is based on the suffering pattern. Let's read one of those together. Look at 1 Peter 2, 21 now through 23. As he's, just, as he's writing specifically here to slaves who are being mistreated by their masters, he doesn't tell them here that they need to respond in a similar way. We might expect that. He says, be willing to suffer injustices. Be willing to suffer persecution. Be willing to suffer as a Christian because you're a Christian even. 4, verse 21 says, To this you have been called. When was the last time we described Christianity that way? The calling of God to follow Jesus is to suffer unjustly and to endure it joyfully. Look at it. Is it because Christ also suffered for you? There's that suffering and cross leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Just to make sure we didn't think, okay, he's the example, but I don't have to follow. He said, that's what you're, that's what you're supposed to do. But what happened with Jesus? He says, he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in turn. When he suffered, he did not threaten. He did not do what we do when maybe we aren't in a position to retaliate, but we began to make threats. Wait until I get my chance. But here's what he did instead. It says that he kept on, continued, entrusting himself to him who judges justly. And I don't know who that is if it isn't his father. Isn't he the one who judges justly? If you compare chapter 4 when he, when he says we share in his sufferings and to rejoice because of that, that's 1 Peter 4, 
12 through 14, don't think it's surprising, but rejoice when you suffer for the name of Jesus because you're sharing in His suffering. And then the very last verse of 1 Peter 4 and 19 sums it up and says, So then, as we suffer, let's commit ourselves, let's entrust ourselves, our souls, to God, to our Creator. Why does He tell us to do that in 1 Peter 4 19? Because it's the example, it's what Jesus, our Lord, has demonstrated for us per 1 Peter 2. 21 through 23. You might go ahead and fill in that last line there that Jesus shows us how to suffer and even how to die. He shows us how to die, not just honorably, but in a godly way. And you try and figure out how to compare yourself to Jesus. I'm not trying to belittle pains and struggles and even what little persecution we endure in our, in our place in the world. But you, you do anything, you make any list and you hold them up to Jesus and His suffering as the fully innocent suffering one. No wonder, Peter says, and this is the mindset change, it's in 1 Peter 4.1, when he says, therefore, let those of us who suffered arm ourselves, it's armor, with the same kind of mindset that turns away from sin. He says, we've spent enough time in sin. When you go through things, when you suffer in general even, it might be a medical issue, it might be some event that happens financially or whatever it is, and for sure, in this setting, when you suffer because you're doing what's right, it has a way of changing your perspective. It has a way of refining the way you see things. It brings clarity. And so he says, Jesus suffered and armed himself with a mindset that says, I'm not going to, I'm going to, not going to sin. He didn't have to see sin. That part's different for us. We've already messed up. Our job is, even in our suffering, to be motivated by his suffering as we follow his example, to also say, I'm done with sin. I've spent enough time with that. And it might be that part of my maturity as a Christian to resist temptation, to grow in my faith, is that I may have to suffer some things like Jesus. You ever think about how long you spend doing things? Do you know that we spend about 500 to 600 hours a year doing something that we have to do, but you know, what, you know what that is? It's eating. We spend about 500 to 600 hours every year eating. That, that was supposed to come out better in my head, okay? I don't know where the doing part came in there. But we, we spend that eating. And you start thinking of all the other things we do, brushing our teeth and and that's why some people don't, that's why some people let, for guys, let their facial hair grow out because they say, you know, why waste time? I can do something else with that time. That's part of the argument here is you've been suffering like Jesus and then you look at sin and it becomes less appealing and part of that also is because he says, you look and think, I've already spent too much time sinning. I mean, any time sinning is too much, isn't it? I've already spent enough of that. It's a time argument too. I'm not going to waste any more of my time with Satan and sin. I know what that's like. I'm not going back to that. Think back to redemption. I've got something different to do now. And my suffering, Claire, makes that even more pointed in life. Jesus shows me how to suffer, how to do so in the right way. Peter's not saying, I want you to go looking for suffering. He's not glorifying pain or anything like that. He is saying that when you go through it, and you are, even because you're just trying to do what's right for Jesus, look to the cross and find your way through that, it, that time of suffering. We've seen from 1 Peter, Peter's cross, three different ways that Jesus' cross is meant to impact our lives that it is redemptive, buying us from sin and giving us a fresh start, that it is transformative then 
that it's meant to change not just who we are, but how we live then, because of who we are. And it's, it gives us a pattern or demonstrates how to suffer for Jesus. So that by the time you get to the end of the letter, 1 Peter 5, verse 11, Peter says, I've written to you about the true grace of God. You stand firm in that. And I point at you, I'm pointing for Peter, and the Holy Spirit pointing right back here. That's what this is. Cross in this good news message is God's real grace. Now we are going to, I'm not sure, I'm not going to name a name because I'm not sure which one of you is leading the invitation song. I guess you announced it, so it's Gary. But Gary, Gary okay, is going to lead us in an invitation song. It's a way we sing together to one another as always, but with a special emphasis on the opportunity to respond and make what may not be right with God right. To put Jesus on in baptism, that cross, receiving its power and its blood was shed on that cross. And then, as we sing sometimes, as a child of God, to live for Jesus. What does that song say? Live for Jesus, oh my brother, his disciple ever be. Render not to any other what alone the Lord's should be. As we stand and sing together.